Carl Rogers, His Life, Theories, and Influence by Brooke Beckius. Carl Rogers was born on January 8, 1902 in Chicago suburb. His parents raised him and his siblings in a very strict and religious household. Rogers' parents decided to move the family outside of Chicago to a farm. Rogers believed it was, this was to keep them away from the city and have a more religious upbringing. Rogers' dad decided to use scientific practices on this farm and had all of his kids join in and help. This led to Rogers' interest in science. Rogers went on to study scientific agriculture at the University of Wisconsin. Due to his religious involvement on campus, he was invited to attend the World Student Christian Federation for six months in China. While Rogers was in China, he was exposed to different cultures and religion and became more tolerant of them. When he wrote back about this to his family, they were displeased. When Rogers returned to the United States and then graduated in 1924, he also got married to a girl named Helen Elliott. Carl and Helen moved to New York for Rogers to study theology at the Union Theological Seminary. Rogers was unhappy with the strict religious teachings at the Union and transferred to Columbia University across the street to take classes in education and psychology. In 1931, he completed his Ph.D. in clinical psychology. His first job was at the Child Study Department of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. At this job, they utilized psychoanalytical therapy, and Rogers found that it failed in many cases. After Rogers failed with one of the clients, the client's mother came to talk to Rogers about her own problems and led to Rogers' belief that clients leading the therapy was better. After Carl Rogers released his first book, The Clinical Treatment of the Problem Child, he received an offer to be a professor at Ohio State University and thus began his academic career. Rogers also worked at a couple other universities and then moved on to the Western Behavioral Science Institute in 1963 where he focused on group therapy. In 1968, he and his colleagues founded the Center for the Studies of the Person where Rogers began to focus on international politics and world peace. He began the Vienna Peace Project where he had leaders from 13 different countries meet. Rogers passed away in 1987 of cardiac arrest after a hip surgery. In his lifetime, Rogers had many accomplishments. He was the president of the American Psychological Association in 1947 and received two awards from this group, the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award in 1956 and the Distinguished Professional Contribution Award in 1972. Rogers' theory of personality was also called the client-centered approach. He believed that people strived to be self-actualized by the organismic valuing process or living according to their true feelings. Self-actualization was stumped by conditions of worth, which were other people's beliefs and values they were expected to conform to instead of their own true feelings. To improve the chances of self-actualization, people should be given unconditional positive regard, which is love and acceptance no matter what. Rogers' theory accentuated the concept of the self, the real self is who the person is at the current time, and the ideal self is who the person wishes to be. Discrepancies between the real and ideal self is known as incongruence, and is often fueled by conditions of worth. Unconditional positive regard can help decrease the amount of discrepancy between the two. Roger believed that the therapist-client relationship was the most important component in therapy. Rogers used the term client rather than patient to symbolize a more equal relationship. The three core conditions of the therapist-client relationship are congruence, unconditional positive regard, and empathy. Congruence means that the therapist's feelings and actions match. Unconditional positive regard means that the therapist accepts and trusts the client. Empathy refers to the therapist attempting to see things from the client's point of view. Through these core conditions, Rogers believes the client will be helped because they are allowed to increase their expression and control in conversation. In client-centered therapy, the client has more authority and is able to guide and structure the therapy session. The therapist has less authority than in more traditional types of therapy 
and simply focuses on using the three core conditions. The therapist actively listens to the client rather than analyzing and trying to diagnose them. By asking reflective questions, the therapist is able to help the client better understand their thought processes. This allows the client to become more self-aware and more self-reliant. Carl Rogers was the first to try to scientifically evaluate therapy. He did this by measuring the correlations between the real and ideal self over the course of therapy. If correlations between the real and ideal self increased over the course of therapy, it was effective. Rogers was also the first to record his therapy sessions and allow the public to view them. Later in his career, Rogers became interested in encounter groups or group therapy. Encounter groups are a gathering of individuals looking to increase their interpersonal skills and self-awareness through interaction. These encounter groups have a facilitator who oversees the group without being an authority figure. These encounter groups also fall under the client-centered approach because they are self-guided and follow the three core conditions. The facilitator accepts the group, trusts the members, empathizes with them, and asks reflection questions. Client-centered therapy is still utilized today. The therapeutic relationship is especially emphasized. Many studies point to the effectiveness of unconditional positive regard and empathy. In most cases, these aspects of client-centered therapy have been absorbed and utilized along with other techniques for more serious mental illness. Since Rogers' death, there have been 777 books, chapters, and articles written, along with organizations and training centers formed for client-centered therapy. Client-centered therapy has been applied in many other fields. The client-centered approach has been used in the field of rehabilitation by motivational interviewing. By using empathy and reflection questions, the therapist is able to help the client overcome addiction. Core conditions in the therapeutic relationship applied to workforce relationships have also been found to increase job performance. Here's my list of references for this presentation. Thank you for watching.